Okay, so um, we welcome today Drs. Erica Conte and Baron Wolf. Um, oh, sorry, <laughs> just lost my notes. Um, who uh, are both members of the research evaluation group um, as part of the international ne network of research management societies that we most often know as INORMS. Um, so today uh, they will outline two major initiatives of the group, the scope framework for responsible research evaluation and the more than our rank global initiative. So a little bit about Drs. Conte and Wolf. So Erica Conte has a PhD in physiology from Western University Canada and has worked in research administration in both academia and industry. She has expertise in research assessment, strategic planning, communication, institutional leadership and research funding. In her current role at the Unity Health Toronto, which is um, part of the network of um, hospital universities um, with the University of Toronto, she's a director of funding strategy and stewardship, um, where she supports a, the full breadth of health research spanning fundamental science through to translational research, health services, policy, and knowledge translation. Welcome, Erica. Um, Baron Wolf has a PhD in policy studies and evaluation from the University of Kentucky and has extensive experience working in institutional research, effectiveness, assessment, and strategic planning within higher education. His work is focused on the use of data analytics uh, to make strategic business decisions and process improvement. So in his current role as the Assistant Vice President for Research and Chief of Staff at the University of Kentucky. He serves senior leadership as an advisor on strategic priorities, programs, and services that support the research community across the campus. In addition, he is the Director of Research Analytics. I don't know how you do this, so maybe you want to talk about this a bit, um, which maintains robust research business intelligence tools, data analytics, reporting, analysis, and assessment tools. So two very busy people, um, I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to Drs. Conte and Wolf, and I'll pass it over to you. Thanks. Thank you so much, Laura, for that great introduction for both Baron and myself. We're really excited to be here today and excited by the great turnout of people. Um, today, we're going to be speaking about uh, using uh, evaluation and metrics responsibly, um, and that's going to be in different contexts. So we'll talk about you know, at an individual context where we might be looking at recognition of individual researchers all the way up to university rankings. So I'd like to begin with acknowledging that we are all gathered on different lands um, and that this has been, um, and that the, all of these lands have been the home of many populations for thousands of years. I personally, I'm situated and located on the traditional territory of the Anishabe Mississauga, which is adjacent to the Mississaugas of Scugog Island First Nation and in the territory that is covered under the Williams Treaty. I would also like to acknowledge that I'm of settler heritage and a guest on these lands, and that I play a role in the work to uncover the truth of past injustices and broken treaties and in the actions towards reconciliation. Um, Baron, did you wanna say a piece here? Yeah, thanks Erica, and thank you everyone for having us. Um, I'm suffering from a little bit of a cold today, so please, uh, I apologize for anything that you might misunderstand, but I would like to acknowledge that the University of Kentucky in Lexington, Kentucky, sits on the traditional territory of the Osage, Shawnee, Cherokee, Adena, and Hopewell peoples. I recognize, honor, and respect the indigenous peoples of the land and their enduring relationships that exist between us and the land. Thank you. So I also want to acknowledge that if any of you don't necessarily know the history of the lands where you're located today, this is a great website, www.native-lands.ca, and it allows you to explore the history, the treaties, um, and the peoples that were inhabiting the lands all around the globe. So both Baron and I are coming to you today um, representing the INORMS Research Evaluation Group, which is a group of research managers from 13 international research management societies and associations around the globe. Um, we are charged with exploring how we can ensure research evaluation is meaningful, responsible, and effective. 
Um, and we represent groups from the UK, Norway, Brazil, the US, China, Japan, Australia, Finland, Denmark, Germany, South Africa, Malaysia, and of course, Canada. So we're going to start off a little bit of an introduction, kind of the what, why, where, when, how, um, and who for research, uh, responsible research assessment, just to make sure that we're all kind of situated in the, in the same general knowledge to begin with. So let's start with the what. So what is responsible research assessment? Um, and that would be, um, as a general definition, it's approaches to assessment, which incentivize, reflect, and reward the plural characteristics of high quality research in, in support of diverse and inclusive research cultures. So that's kind of where we're starting off today with a general uh, definition. So let's go into why, uh, and this is a really important one. Why is it important to think about responsible research assessment? And the first thing I wanna talk about actually is to maintain institutional autonomy. So a lot of external evaluations, for example, the university rankings um, are, uh, uh, can lead organizations to have a mismatch between what they're aiming for and what they truly value. Um, so having um, your assessment reflect what your institutional missions and values are is really important to maintain the autonomy of what a given organization is working towards. And this, you know, is reflected and important because of things like Campbell's Law that tells us we get what we measure. So institutions need to measure what matters to them, not what matters to other people. Um, in order to maintain that autonomy and in order to generate greater outcomes that align with the missions of your own individual institutions. The second reason why to think about responsible research assessment is to make better decisions. So evaluations are often used as indicators um, that are not inappropriate proxies for things that we seek to measure, which can lead to very poor decision making and unintended consequences. For example, you can imagine when you see something happening faster or more often, this can be assumed to be better, even if it's not at all a reflection of quality. So here in this cartoon, you can see that the one line looks like it might be a lot more, a, a better line because it's a lot shorter, things are happening faster. But in fact, this is all misinformation and the longer line is better quality. So normally it's a combination of quantitative and qualitative approaches that provides better answers for our evaluation questions. A third reason why this is important is to ensure a return on investment. First of all, research is normally publicly funded. So it's important to evaluate the proper use of these funds. However, research evaluation itself also costs money and institutions should weigh up the cost benefit ratio of undertaking various assessments. Um, it may be that their ends can be achieved in different ways. So here is a, another cartoon that kind of evaluates this where somebody's saying, collect all the information you can and we'll think about how we use it later. And I've actually seen this in my, in my own work over the years where this is often the approach. Um, however, this is going to use a lot of resources, a lot of time, a lot of money, and is definitely um, not a good use of those resources that we all have. The fourth reason why is to establish operational readiness. So there is definitely an increased focus, and we'll talk about this a little bit more in our presentation, about the use of responsible research evaluation. And various sectors are starting to make this um, more important within their guidelines. Um, so this could be different funding agencies, different governments uh, that will eventually start to make this a requirement. So being operationally ready for these changes that we know are coming. Um, there's things like the Global Research Council that's taking interest in how these uh, will become a requirement in the near future. And the last area of why is to manage reputational risk and enhance staff well-being. 
So I think we can understand that as a result of sector agendas, the misuse of research metrics is coming under increased scrutiny. If there is a, a gaming of metrics, if there is a misrepresentation, it can put your institution at a very large risk with media fallback, which I don't think anybody would want. Um, the overuse of poor metrics also has a very negative impact on staff well-being and mental health. There's actually been some very high profile cases where poor valuations of individuals has led to very, very tragic uh, consequences. So where is responsible research assessment happening? Um, and the answer here is it is happening across the globe. There is work happening in North America with things like DORA, and we'll talk about some institutions withdrawing from rankings. Um, more in the European area, we have a, a, an array of things from the Leiden Manifesto, the metric tide. Uh, COAR has recently been established. Uh, the EU multi-rankings in Germany have really taken an approach to doing this more responsibly. There's things also in Asia from the Hong Kong principles and other institutions withdrawing from rankings. So this is happening globally, um, and we need to make sure that Canada is in step with what's happening around the world. Um, so next is when should or is responsible research assessment happening? The answer here is all the time. So we should be thinking about responsible um, research assessment when we're evaluating researchers, when we're evaluating individual projects, when we're evaluating programs or centers, entire institutions, regions such as states or provinces or countries. All of those things uh, should be done responsibly. And then who's involved? So obviously academic institutions are very much at the center of this. Um, however, funding agencies are very much thinking about what is their role in, in responsible research assessment. Um, various ranking agencies themselves are looking at how they can be involved, government, as well as other stakeholders as well. So I've done the who, what, when, where, and I'm going to turn the how over to Baron, which is, you know, part of what we're really interested in is a lot of us know why we should do this, but we don't really know where to start with the how. So Baron, over to you. Great. Thanks, Erica. And again, I apologize for clearing my throat and such. Um, uh, but yeah, I'm going to go over the scope framework for uh, responsible research evaluation that was developed by the iNORMS group. Uh, so scope is a simple five-step process for evaluating research responsibly, which encourages people to first start with what they value about things that they are evaluating, then consider the context in which they are actually doing the evaluation, look at all of the options for evaluating, there's some options that might be better than others, and then also before probing deeply, any proposed solution um, you want to probe deeply for any unintended consequences. And then prior to evaluating, we want to make sure we're evaluating our evaluation as well. So it's a secular cycle uh, that should, should never really stop. You keep making improvements. Next slide, please. So the scope framework operates, operate, it operates using three specific guiding principles. The first is to evaluate only when necessary, thinking about is an evaluation appropriate for what you're considering? Um, and maybe not all the time is an evaluation actually necessary. The second principle is to evaluate with the evaluated. The world is recognizing the, the in quotes, nothing about me without me principle in that all walks of life and evaluation is no different. So any evaluation that you do should also be co-designed and co-interpreted with the communities in which are that are being evaluated. Th the third and last principle is to draw upon evaluation expertise. A criticism often leveled at research evaluation methodologies is that they do not match up with the standards of rigor that we would expect in our academic research. Indicators are a poor proxy for the concepts they seek to indicate. Data are not supplied. 
uh, without error bars and poor survey methodology results in misleading findings. It's important that we draw on the appropriate evaluation expertise when designing our evaluation approaches. If we don't have it, we, we need to develop it within our systems, uh, which is what SCOPE can help us do. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, so let's move on to the actual framework. Uh, in step one of SCOPE, we start with the S, or starting with what we value about what the things we're evaluating. It might sound obvious, but all too often, we don't really start our evaluations here. We start with what external actors value. What do university rankings value? What do funders value? What do politicians value? And not so much about our missions as institutions, as research organizations. Uh, and of course, uh, there's other things that we do here as well, is to start with the data that's available to us and work backwards. Next slide. Uh, this here is an image of what we call the streetlight effect uh, that's illustrated by this cartoon. Uh, this individual on the right has lost their wallet. So the detective is asking, um, is this where you've lost your wallet? And the, the individual replies, well, no, it's just where the light is. So that's where I'm looking. I lost it in the park. So many, many times evaluations rely on things that don't necessarily matter. We rely on bibliometric data, not because of the volume of publications or citations is what we value, but because it is so readily available and it's easy to use. Once we are clear about what we value, we need to consider the context of our evaluation. We hear many arguments about which indicators are responsible and which are not, but we can't have the conversation without knowing the context. Um, that is the what and the why in which the indicator is going to be used. This is the next step within the scope framework. So for example, plotting uh, the publication volume of one country against that of another for the sole purposes of understanding their relative productivity levels uh, has very little impact on the countries under assessment. So we've labeled that green here on this matrix. However, any form of assessment at the level of an individual that results in a reward actually has a high impact on those individuals and therefore carriers carries a greater uh, degree of risk for that individual. Next slide. And of course, um, the other key uh, is the context consideration is discipline. So an evaluation approach that works for one discipline will not necessarily work for another. For example, to evaluate publications in health or biomedical, in basic science impact factors is often a good indication of quality, while other disciplines like indigenous health um, is not uh, a good indication of quality or health policy, policy research, where many publications may not even be peer reviewed journal manuscripts, but rather governmental reports or clinical guidelines. So discipline matters in this context. Then we move on to the O for options. This is a reminder that we do have options. We don't have to reach our metrics all the time based on uh, quantitative metrics. We do have different options. The important thing to consider here is whether your indicator is a suitable proxy for the thing that you're evaluating. Click next. We think that the rule of thumb here is that generally speaking, quantitative measures are generally, genu generally for quantifiable things, such as citations, publications, dollar amount for money, number of students, and so forth. And qualitative measures are qualifiable things. For example, quality, excellence, or value. Next. Uh, and we should be especially careful if using quantitative indicators as a proxy for qualitative things. It's important to remember that citations do not equal quality and the university's rankings does not alone represent the excellence of an institution. And while it's easy to criticize quantitative indicators, we have to remember that while peer review is often considered the gold standard of research evaluation, there is a lot of concern about peer review. 
However, the challenges of measuring both qualitative and qu qualitatively and quantitatively um, are why we have the next stage within the scope framework. Once you've developed your evaluation approach in line with your values, the context considerations, and the options, the fourth step of the scope framework is to probe deeply. You'll want to ask yourself four different questions. Why does the chosen approach, or, or who does the pros and a cho pro chosen approach discriminate against? Perhaps early career and researchers, or women, or non-journal-based disciplines. So you really want to ask who might be biased or discriminate against. Secondly, you want to ask how might this approach be gamed? When there is a prize, there is a game. Keep in mind what, peop what people will optimize to their best benefit. And thirdly, um, you want to think about what the uh, unintended consequences might be. This question should be asked for both institutional as well as at the individual. For example, if the evaluation uh, doesn't take disciplinary difference comprehensively enough into account, it could have negative influences on not, not just traditional ways of doing research, such as interdisciplinarity causing, sorry, just a second. <clears throat> causing uh, different ways of doing research, such as caused by, for an example, traditional nature of journal metrics. Or if the evaluation is to focus on bibliometric indicators, it could result into individual researchers focusing on research areas that are more visible in publication databases or narrowing the type of publications according to assessment criteria. In other words, individual researchers start playing the game and give less emphasis on their own ambitions and aims uh, and so forth. And finally, you wanna ask the question, does the cost of measuring outweigh the benefits? If it cannot be stressed enough that the costs, including the workload, should be proportional to the aims and anticipation, anticipated outcomes of the evaluation. Next slide. Now we have reached the last step of the stage of the evaluation model. It's the E or evaluate your evaluation. We then start the evaluation process over. It's time to evaluate your evaluation. Go back to the start, ask yourself if the evaluation approach brought new insights to what you value. No matter how happy you are with the approach, be open to adjustments. It is always possible to do the evaluation better, include different stakeholders or those being evaluated. Be open um, uh, and keep in mind that the area of evaluation is subject to constant change. So just because an evaluation approach worked previously, it does not mean that it will still work forever. Building in a regular view of evaluation approaches and doing so with units under evaluation is really an essential part of the evaluation process. And while we present scope in a linear step, step-by-step -step process in reality, it is of course an iterative process that changes each time. Next slide. The last thing I wanna mention is just a shameless plug about this scope framework. You'll see here on the slide that we have um, a a conference coming up in March in Albuquerque, New Mexico. It was funded by the Institute of Museum and Library Services. Uh, this is a two-day in-person event where myself and uh, Erica and others from the iNorms group will be workshopping the scope framework uh, for two full days uh, with attendees. Registration is open if you're interested, and this is just a quick plug for that for you to find out more information. I'm now gonna turn it over back over to Erica uh, to talk a little bit more about rankings and their use within this process. Thanks so much, Baron. So the next question is kind of how do international rankings fit within responsible research assessment? That's mainly because we don't have a lot of control over the rankings. So some people often ask this question. So there's clearly been a large proliferation in national and international university rankings. 
Um, but there is already raising concern on the inappropriate methods used to create the rankings and the inappropriate use of rankings by both institutions and government. The problem is whilst they claim to identify the top universities in the world, they typically offer a very pure, uh, poor proxy for institutional quality and often not uh, and often only provide a very narrow view of what a university does. For example, the institution staff student ratio or the number of prize winning Nobel alumni are used to indicate the teaching quality and the research quality of an institution. Obviously, just because you have a great ratio of teachers to students doesn't mean that those teachers are great. And just because you have one or two uh, Nobel Prize winning alumni doesn't mean the research quality of the whole institution is great. So they're not um, indicators of the holistic measure of those quality. There's also recognized concerns over the quality of self-submitted and unverifiable institutional information and the problematic use of bibliometric data and reputational surveys, most of which has been proven to um, not only, only measure brand awareness, um, not really quality in any way. Um, of course, there are some exceptions. So the CWTS TS Leiden ranking publishes stability intervals alongside with their data, which puts a question mark over uh, many parts of the ranking positions. Um, but there's very few other rankings that, that do this, that are trying to actually think about how we can improve the quality of the ranking. And Canada is not new to this. I don't know if some of you remember, but uh, probably about 15 years ago, there was actually a boycott across Canada for the McLean ranking, which many of us know is a very popular one that students use to choose their universities. And it was based on the very poor um, methods that were involved in those rankings and the lack of transparency. And McLean's did improve some of that. Um, I still don't think it's at the level of what's required these days, but um, I, Canada was one of the first to actually start, you start boycotting rankings, which has made us a leader in this area. So there's several others that recently have been re uh, withdrawing from rankings as the scrutiny over these, you know, continues to increase. So here's a couple examples. We have three major universities uh, in China that have removed themselves from the rankings. This was a very big deal because most Chinese institutions are very, very focused on the rankings and use that really to guide their own strategy. We have a couple of the very big institutions in the US that are removing themselves. So the Harvard Medical School, as well as the Yale, Harvard and Berkeley Law Schools have all removed themselves in the past from the US news rankings. A couple very recent examples is in this past year, Utrecht University in the Netherlands uh, removed themselves from the Times Higher Education rankings. Um, and I'll, I'll briefly touch on this a little bit later in my talk, as well as uh, Korea boycotts the QS rankings and really wants to talk about that there's a lot to that they should be proud about, which really is going to fit in well with what I'm going to bring up next as our initiative from iNORMS. So some uh, general recommendations that are also, you know, highlighting this as a major area of concern. So there was the core agreement on reforming research assessment that was published. And one of their four commitments here, number four, is to avoid the use of rankings of research organizations in research assessment so that that should not be a part of it. And then as well, the Harnessing the Metric Tide, uh, their revised version number 10 is to rethink university rankings. So we're seeing this in many different recommendations and things that are coming through. So iNORMS really thought about this and thought, you know, like how can we help to make a difference in this space and begin to change culture, knowing that rankings aren't going to go away. Um, but definitely need to be used more responsibly. And our response to this is the creation of the More Than Our Rank initiative. So More Than Our Rank initiative uh, allows academic institutions are demonstrating a commitment to responsible assessment and to acknowledge the broader and more diverse definition of institutional success. 
I think many universities are not going to stop talking about the rankings, but what we're really hoping with this initiative is you can talk about your rank ranking in the context of all of the other things that you're also go, uh, good at. Acknowledging the fact that the rankings are very narrowed and very biased and therefore can't possibly reflect everything that is in alignment with your institution. So it's an opportunity for institutions to really publicly de declare in a narrative way how much they offer the world apart from the global rankings. Um, and that every institution, whether they're in the top 10 or whether they're yet to place, can all participate in this initiative. Um, and more than our rank uh, provides an opportunity for our higher education institutions to say how they are great, right? And it, it's a way for us to really take hold of our brand and take hold of what we, we matter. So I've put in the link here. There's a lot more on our website than we'll be able to talk about today where you can find more information. But there's several uh, universities and organizations and ac academic institutions that are already on board. Uh, we have about 17 signatories already from many different um, countries around the world. Um, my institution of Unity Health is the only Canadian one. However, I know there's several um, institutions across Canada currently thinking about more than our rank and working through the process of hope, hopefully becoming signatories. Um, there are several in the UK, several in Holland, we have Italy, we have Turkey, we have Moldova, we have Iran, we have, so there's a, a good breadth of different countries that are all thinking about this. We also have many supporting organizations that are really supporting more than our rank. So there's a whole section on our website of all of the amazing organizations that are very vocally and publicly supportive of more than our rank. So the question you might be asking is, well, how can my institution participate? Well, institutions can sign up online. It's very similar to the process of signing up for DOOR in that you just go to a website um, so our more than our right rank website, uh, we ask that you post a statement on your web pages somewhere on your own institution, highlighting how your institution is in fact more than their rank. So it's normally a short paragraph highlighting really the things that are not captured in the rankings that you would like the public to know. Um, and then in doing so, we'll add the your logo to the more than our rank page and link it to that statement that you've posted on your own web pages. Um, so by providing the statement to INORMS, and that's really it. There, there's not a huge burden. It's not at all creating a lot of work for institutions. It's not in any way saying that you have to boycott talking about your rankings. It's just helping institutions learn to put them in context of what they're doing and what they're good at and what they value. So if you need help persuading your institution, we've actually developed a document for that as well. Um, so the link is here on the right hand side of the page, but you'll be able to go again to our website and find it's a, a two page document outlining the many ways why an institution should participate in more than our rank, which you can use when talking to the institutional leadership. Now, since the launch of More Than Our Rank, it's now actually become very clear recommendations from a lot of very large uh, organizations. So you'll see on the left here, we have the European University Association or the AU, uh, EUA um, released a briefing in October of 23, 2023, stating that academic institutions should consider support of More Than Our Rank initiative. This is what this is one of their main considerations that they're recommending in this briefing. Um, and then you'll see on the right, there was a document that was produced uh, in the last year by the University of the Netherlands. So this is a collective of all the universities across the Netherlands. And it's a recommendation paper. And at the institutional level, they are in fact asking that all of the universities across the Netherlands are all encouraged to sign up and support the More Than Our Rank initiative. 
So if you're interested in, in more details about this uh, information, we also will be having some spotlight sessions coming up where we're talking about various things related to the rankings and related to more than our rank. And we have a spotlight session coming up in on April 16th. Um, again, you can go to our website. I've put the link at the bottom there and it's free to sign up and register for this. The first one, Professor David McCoy from the United Nations University International Institute of Global Health recently led a significant review on the coloniality and biases of the global university rankings. And this exposed the rankings as a mechanism by which the concentration of power and prestige among universities in the global north is maintained and describes the resulting negative influence on the global health priorities. Um, so that is our first one in April. The second one in May, which unfortunately some of you might know was originally scheduled for March and had to be rescheduled, is Dr. Royad Janahan is an associate professor at the Michigan State University. And he will be talking about the ideas of evaluating research quality and what's involved there and the role of the for-profit business and media influence of the global university rankings. So, oh, I didn't need to do that. Sorry, everyone. So you can sign up for either of these online. And there's also actually recordings to our past sections sessions. So back in December, we actually uh, had the uh, Utrecht University talk about why they withdrew from the Times Higher Education rankings and what their thought process was and their, their process for that. So you can always listen to that recording as well from our, one of our past sessions. And I want you all to remember that we can help. We, meaning the iNORMS Research Evaluation Group, uh, we can help you if you're not sure how to apply SCOPE. We do provide consultations. We do provide workshops. Uh, we've actually did a workshop at the University of Alberta. So Thane can always give people here some information on how that went. Um, and we can also just have more discussions and support. We're happy to do that. You can reach out to myself or to Baron, or to Lizzie Gad, who is our chair of the iNORMS Research Evaluation Group, um, or go through our website as well. So those are all various ways to contact us. So I wanna remind everybody, research evaluation is a big job um, and doing it responsibly might take a lot of work. Um, and we're not expecting things to change overnight, but we do know that a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. So we're hoping that institutions are willing to take these small steps to start to use the scope framework, start to think about signing up to more than our rank as we change culture in the direction towards responsible research, etc. 